Well, you sang uh, my favourite chorus to start with, The Goodness of God. And um, it just reduces me to tears when I sing that. Because I think, and I'm standing there thinking all the ways that God has met me and touched my life over the years. Um, from stealing motorbikes at 14 at the station and riding 40 miles an hour at the age of 14 on a Lambretta uh, without a helmet, without gloves, not a scratch. God was just there. Um, from when I was about eight or nine, having a, a sweet stuck in my throat, couldn't breathe, and how I ran nearly 100 yards home to my mum, I've no idea, but she got it out crashing into the back of a milk float in the snow on my Honda 50, colliding with a Kawasaki 1000cc, and mine was 50cc, uh, at the Aldwych Theatre, uh, coming home from work, running out of oil on my Honda 50cc. All happens if you have a Honda 50cc, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> running out of oil, engine seizing, stopping immediately and the car come in and hitting you so you're rolling down the hill. The goodness of God. And I used to pray when I went to work and say, Lord, will you protect me? As I go to work on my fast Honda 50cc <laughs> where the pedestrians overtook you. <laughs> and, uh, and then one day I forgot to pray and, and I said, oh Lord, I forgot to pray. And he said, look, I don't protect you because you prayed. I protect you because I love you. Isn't that lovely? And I just want you to think now of just one thing, just one thing you're really thankful to God for. And let's give him a clap. Um, we're going to look at a, a character this morning from 2 Samuel 9, and he's not very often talked about, I don't feel. Uh, his name's Mephibosheth, or Mephibosheth. However, you, you don't want to say that with your dentures in, let me tell you. And um, yeah, 2 Samuel 9, I'm, I'm going to read uh, the chapter so we can get a full understanding of what's happening in our story. It's 2 Samuel 9. And verse 1, it says, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba, your servant, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? God's kindness. Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. And when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul came to David. He bowed down to pay him honour. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And the king summoned Zibar, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's uh, grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. 
Now Zibar had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then Zibar said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Zibar's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. Um, I've entitled this morning, uh, Mephibosheth, Drawing the Short Straw. And we all know what that means. I don't know whether you've been a recipient of drawing the short straw in life. Um, you know, when you're at school and you, you split up into teams uh, and you had to choose people, I'll have him and I'll have him and I'll have them and I'll have them. There was always one person left who couldn't play football, couldn't do anything, but they were there because they just wanted to join in. <clears throat> and we used to think, oh, I've got to pick them. Uh, and you feel like you've drawn the short straw. Something that's unfortunate. Something that perhaps hasn't gone your way. And when you think of this, of this man, Mephibosheth, you, you may know, but in 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, uh, his nurse picked him up and she was hurrying out and she dropped him and she became crippled. So that was the first thing about him. You think, well, you know, that's not a very good start in life, is it? And then his name means from the mouth of shame. So there's a big element of shame about him, possibly shame because he was crippled, shame because he possibly was a bit of an outcast. He came from a place called Lodabar, low in Hebrew is no. Uh, Dabar is word, no word, no communication. It actually means an unfruitful land. So he's had an unfortunate experience, um, He's come from a place where there's no fruitfulness and, uh, and his name means shame. And as I was thinking about this today, I thought of how many of us can possibly identify with some of those feelings that Mephibosheth went through. Feelings in our past, feelings in our childhood, even feelings and situations that we come across today. Now, none of those difficult situations were any of his making. So we have to admit and say, well, although I'm going through a difficult time, although my name might be there, so I might have lived there, that's nothing to do with anything that I've done. And I think sometimes we live in guilt and shame because of our origins, of our, of our, of our childhood, and none of that was anything to do with us but we still carry, very often, the effects of how those things touched us and how those things wounded us. And we carry them. And some people still carry them 40 or 50 years later. And I suppose what I want to do today is to see how that when Jesus comes into the equation, we don't have to carry those things anymore. Because there's hope with Jesus and there's life with Jesus. And he said, I am come that you might have life, finish it off. <laughs> and have it more abundantly. God is a generous God, isn't he? His promises in Christ are yea and amen. He's not stingy. And so we have a situation where We've had negative influences in, in our life. We've had disadvantages. And, and I felt as I was preparing this, I wanted, to, I wanted to zone in on one of those aspects of Mephibosheth, which he had to put up with, and that was his name. And I've met people, I met a lady in Jerusalem many, many years ago, and she was a stranger to me, but she was in the par party, and I said, what's your name? And she gave me this name. Can't remember what it was now. And almost instantly she said, yeah, but my real name is Pauline. And I said, well, why did you change your name then? She said, well, I don't like Pauline. And Paul actually means little. So whether Pauline, whether she felt there was a, a spirit of smallness, a spirit of intimidation about her life, 
but she went through life calling herself something when she was something else. How sad that is. And I don't know if there's anyone here this morning, you might have changed your name. You might hate your name. But the fact is, there is power in a name. And I really believe that we should, we should say, this is my name, and that's what I'm going to be called. So I'm not suggesting if you change your name, you change it back again. I don't want you to feel guilty and all that sort of thing. But there's a release in your name. There really is. The Rebeccas I've met in life. I don't know if, I won't ask, put your hand up if you're a Rebecca. But your Rebecca's in life. The meaning is a noose. And instantly people think of hanging. So it's negative. But you see, when you throw somebody a lasso and a noose who's drowning, that's not negative, is it? So you get to look at the other side. And that's Rebecca's. I saw a lady last, last Sunday. I said, what's your name? She said, Mary. It might be some Marys here. I don't know. I said, do you know where that comes from? She said, yeah. And it comes from Mara, the Hebrew. Miriam, Mara, means bitterness. And all the Marys are walking around thinking, well, I'm really bitter and I'm going to have bitter experiences. <laughs> Rather than thinking, God might use me as a Mary to reach out to people who are in bitter situations. Why can't we see the other side? And we should be able to see a different point of view. And I couldn't resist the, um, the meaning of the name Alan. And, uh, and I just wanted to encourage your pastor uh, with the meanings of these names. Have we got anyone else here called Alan? <laughs> Apart from me. <laughs> and it says, Celtic in origin, Alan, possibly meaning a rock. A person of proud bearing who will always provide. He's solid in his affections. He's totally faithful that you're like this. A man of Herculean proportions. <laughs> well, something went wrong with me, but anyway. <laughs> um, a person with reassuring presence. He will always be the calming influence in a crisis. From the Gaelic word for cheerful. He's smart. He makes friends easily. Never loses his sense of humour. He thrives on a challenge. Well, if ever you've heard one of Alan's jokes, uh, you'll know. <laughs> but there is power in a name. But the principle is that let's embrace what we've been given. Let's embrace who we are. Now, in most languages, a word can mean one thing and it can actually mean the opposite as well. The same in Hebrew. And Mephibosheth, having said to you that it's about shame, on the other side, it means blowing away shame and scattering disgrace. And I believe in Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit, each one of us have the power and the wherewithal and God has given us the necessary to dispel our guilt and our shame. And you can say to yourself, and you can say to the Lord, I will not live under that anymore. Today, it stops. Today, it has no power over me anymore. And in Isaiah 49, verse 16, isn't it lovely? It says, our names are written on the palms of his hands. So whether you like your name or not, God loves your name. Because he loves you. So if you've got an issue with names or whatever, then have a chat with me afterwards and I can pray for you and um, see what happens when Jesus gets involved. So this is Mephibosheth and, you know, uh, not a very awe-inspiring beginning. And then from verse 6 onwards, he comes in to the presence of... Of the king. Oh, see the parallel there? Well, <laughs> nice and easy. Comes into King David and things begin to change. And you'll know as well as me, when we come into the presence of King Jesus, 
things begin to change. And uh, it says um, from verse 6 uh, onwards, um, David said three times, I want to show him kindness. It says that, verse 1, verse 3, verse 7. He promised in verse 7 to restore to him the things that had got lost, in fact, the land of Saul, and also to eat at the king's table. Now, Mephibosheth never knew any of this was going to go on, but David gets hold of the fact that, you know, there's a connection there, and he wants to bless him. Even with all his conflict, even with all his past and all the troubles and all the rest of it, He wants to bless him because he's now in the king's presence. Um, If you're as old as I am, you'll (coughs) remember the goons. Do you remember the goons? (laughs) No? Some of you do. And uh, it was Michael Benteen and Peter Sellers and Harry Seacombe and Spike Milligan. And Spike Milligan was the brains behind the operation. But if you know anything about Spike Milligan, and I'm not going to mention his epitaph, you know, I told you I was ill, that sort of thing, when he died. But um, he was so unique, he was a genius, <clears throat> but he was flawed, as we all are. He used to bank at Coots, where I used to work, and he rang up one day and he said, uh, hello, he said, uh, can you tell me the balance on my account? <clears throat> well, in those days, we had to identify somebody over the phone. You know, tell us something personal about yourself and all. So this uh, girl, she said, how do I know it's you, Mr. Milligan? So he said, hold on a minute. So she heard the patter of feet. And then it went silent. And then she heard the patter of feet coming back to the phone. Said, I know it's me, I've just looked in the mirror. (laughs) And she said, she said, I know it's you, Mr. Milligan. (laughs) Nobody else would have said that. But with all that genius and all that humour, he was vicious, he was jealous, he was a man who was angry. And when his brother came along, there was, there was conflict there. And uh, it, it, it is said that he, through his wounds, that he was so wounded that he never grew up. In other words, he used his humour and his childlikeness, if you like, to cover up the hurt that was still there in his adult life. And don't we do that? We see that in the garden, don't we? Adam and Eve hiding. Adam, where are you? And God would say that perhaps to you. Where are you? Where's the real you? I don't want you to hide anymore. You don't have to hide with me. I can see you anyway. I know what you're like. I know where you've been. I know what you've done. You can't pull the wool over my eyes. So why do we do it? Why do we cover up something that's going on inside and actually keep it from the Lord and not discuss it with the Lord when he is so willing and so able to deal with it for us? A few years ago, I read a verse from Joel 2, 25. And unbeknownst to me, as I was reading it, someone started crying because it meant something to them. And all it was was the Lord said, I want to restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And that meant something to her. I don't think she ever told me what it was. But that might mean something to you. You know, our lives very often are full of regrets, aren't they? Things that we can't change. I wish I'd have done this. I wish I'd done it earlier, later not at all, and all this sort of thing. Well, we do not have to live with those regrets anymore. Because when you are in the king's presence, the Lord shows us kindness. He shows us grace. And in the Greek, the word kindness, krestos, is the nearest word to Christos, which is Christ. So kindness is so, so powerful. And whenever I come into this church, you know, you've got David and Judy in the entrance hall, smiling away, you know, wonderful, give you hugs and all this sort of thing. And you, you feel you've come home. It's wonderful. 
And only for the first time this morning when I came in, I noticed the signs above your door. Have you ever noticed them? Yeah? That's because I've always come in looking straight ahead and I haven't lifted up my head. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and enter his courts with praise. It pays to look up, not to look down all the time. And I understand that, um, I don't know anything about plants, but somebody, somebody told me that the bluebells, I had a bluebell in my garden the other day, I'd never seen it ever in my life. And uh, someone said, oh, the English bluebells stoop. Their stem, like, looks down, they droop. But the Spanish bluebells stand upright and look up. And I thought, that's so what do you want to be? Do you want to be an English bluebell? Or a Spanish one. That's, it's a spiritual truth there. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. Absolutely. And aren't we in a situation where we have to, we've looked up, but we want to encourage others to look up, don't we? <clears throat> have you read about the children at school who want to be called animals now? They want to be called a horse? They want to be called a dinosaur? They want to be called dogs. One child's been dressing up in a cape because he wants to be called the moon. And another child is a cat. And when the teacher asks, well, you're not allowed to say her or him, are you? But uh, him, <coughs> a question, he meows back the answer. It's a bit sad. I tell you, the fallen state of our world, with all its money, with all its riches, with all its supposed wisdom spiralling out of control. And no one, but no one on the face of the earth can do anything about it. Doesn't matter who you are, Bezos, Elon Musk, doesn't matter who you are. Push the limits, push the limits, push the limits, push the limits. Let's live on the moon. Let's live on Mars. Pushing, pushing, pushing. And God's sitting there and he, he laughs at the nations, really. But he's sad too at the foolishness. And that's why it's important for us to realise that when Jesus met the woman at the well, she tried to cover up her sadness and her dissatisfaction with five husbands. One didn't work, let's go on to the next. That didn't work, let's go on to the next. It never works. Let me tell you, it never works covering up something inside with something on the outside. It needs to be the inside that is dealt with. So Mephibosheth meets Jesus and things begin to change. And when I came in this morning, Kathleen came up to me and she was like, woo. And, uh, I mean, you know Kathleen more than I do. And she was saying, oh, God's done this and God's done that. I'm so excited. So, uh, so I just said, Kathleen, would you share for a couple of minutes what you're so excited about? So this might be good, Kathleen, for you to... This isn't a mini, mini preach, Kathleen. It's just a couple of minutes where you're telling us what God has done, what, what you were telling me. That's it. Off you go. Stand up. You can do. Yeah. So everyone can hear you. Thank you. 
Kathleen, I thought you were going to take off then, because you were doing all this. Yeah, you feel like it. Yeah, I know. I, I understand. <laughs> Just a third little point about Mephibosheth. Uh, right at the end, um, it's mentioned about him eating at the king's table. And it says that three times. You know, he's going to eat at my table. He's going to eat at my table. He's going to always eat at my table. And, you know, that is such a lovely gesture of honour from a king to somebody that he didn't even know existed. <laughs> he didn't even... And, and yet, yeah, he, he brings him into the, his presence and he always is going to be sitting with me in that special place. Now, earlier on in verse 3, it describes Mephibosheth as someone who's crippled. That's a physical... Crippling. In verse 13, if you've got the NIV, it uses the same word. And it says, and he was crippled in both feet. But the Hebrew isn't the same word as the word in verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3 means to be physically crippled. Verse 13 means Passover, Pesach. So crippled in verse 13 he was crippled in both feet. So in other words, as he's sitting at the table, can you see the fact that he's crippled makes no difference because they're all sitting down. Our crippling, when we're in the presence of the king, actually was, as it were, as if it never happened. You know, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. So that word, crippled in verse 13, means Passover. It means to dance, it means to hop, and it means to skip. And this is addressed and describing somebody who can't even walk. But can you see, it's something spiritual that's going on in his life. It doesn't matter that he cannot walk. His crippling wasn't addressed. He wasn't healed, and yet inside... He could probably jump higher than anyone else, dance like anyone else because of the king. And uh, I, know, I know a person, don't you? Kathleen does, obviously, that he gets our crippling and he gets our conflicts and he gets our shame and our guilt and all the things that we can never change. And he does this which is what this is about. And he says, now it's washed away. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? When somebody pays your debt, incredible, wonderful. And I just read this quote, and uh, you'll understand this if, you, as you, if you're a driver, and most of you are. The reason why the rear view mirror, you might have heard this before, is so much smaller than the front windscreen, both of which you look through, is that the rear view mirror shows you where you've been and the front windscreen shows you where you're going. And where you've been is less important than where you're going. 
so we can leave our history with God. There's nothing we can do about the things that remain undone. But from today, we can turn over that nice new page of our lives, can't we? Do you remember in school when you were given an exercise book? A new exercise book. Oh, what a wonderful day that was. You know, your old one had marks on and the paper was wrinkled. And the first thing you did with your new book is I put my uh, ruler down and I drew a margin. And I, it was lovely. It was nice and clean until I started writing in it. <laughs> it became a bit messy. But that's what it's like with Jesus, isn't it? Hallelujah. And all that became and all that was given to Mephibosheth belongs to us today in Jesus Christ. And do I hear a loud hallelujah? Amen. <laughs> Amen. So we